So I had the privilege, it's just me, is it like meant to be this dark here? Did someone for, oh, okay, I think this is better, right? <laughs> I had the privilege of speaking last month as well. Last month, I spoke on a message called Awestruck, asking us if we are in awe of who God is. When was the last time we may have had a sense of wonder as we came before our God? That sometimes, because of the a very egalitarian type of society we live in, where it's not uh, very much a culture of honor, sometimes we bring God down to our level, and we don't recognize Him as our master, as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And because our view of God can become so diluted or, 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 or so lowered, that's why sometimes even in the church, when we speak about the love of God for us, it becomes devalued, almost like, and it almost feels insulting to say it, but it's like a girl that you don't like or a guy you don't like, like you're disgusted by, you know, and you find out they like you, and you're almost, and it just doesn't move you, right? It's like, and, and we talk about the love of God, and, and we don't recognize just how great it is because we don't fully recognize how awesome the God of the universe is, and when He declares to us that He loves us with an everlasting love. So even before we talk about the love of God, sometimes we have to kind of roll it back and remember who he is and how tiny we are, really, before the God of the universe so that when such an awesome, infinite being from who is from everlasting to everlasting and when he declares that he loves us, it absolutely changes our lives. So to a degree, last time I spoke, I kind of wanted to remind us just how tiny we were in light of who God is, that there should be an appropriate level of humility that we come before God because we are like nothing, like a grass that appears one day and is gone the next. So having established that, because some of you may remember from yesterday's Bible time passage in 2 Timothy 3, it says, in the end times, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, arrogant, proud, disobedient to their parents, and it just goes on and on. But you know, honestly, as we read that, isn't that so much a commentary of our society? People who love themselves who love money, arrogant, proud, disobedient to their parents. If teenagers rebel against their parents, we just say that's just how it is and it's normal. When the Word of God actually declares that that's actually not normative, but children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. And so we let what is the standard of society actually overrule what the, God of, what the Word of God actually declares. And so we get a rebellious generation, and then even as we become adults, even though we are called to honor our parents for the rest of our lives, we fail to do so and think nothing of it because that's the kind of people who will be existing in the end times. They are in love with themselves, love with money, arrogant, proud, all of these things. And again, we have to allow those words to speak to us because God's words, His encouragements and warnings both need to be taken seriously. We should not be proud and always assume that we're always landing on the sweet side of the bell curve because we happen to come to church, but to really examine our own selves as well. So having established just how tiny we are before a holy and awesome and mighty God that we are that all the people of the earth will amount to nothing before him. And having established that, I do want to tell us now the counterpoint to that today of what God has done on behalf of such worthless, tiny creatures like us and elevated us to something beyond our wildest imagination. 
Because, and I know this, I mean, sounds wild, or it should sound wild. Maybe we, it's become too familiar to us. But if you really think about this, I think it's crazy that I believe when God created us humans, it's because he wanted a family. And I think that's a crazy concept. And to a certain degree, I believe that the God of, God of the universe, that he, he had the father heart, it was his design, he created us to be his children, but not only so, that he wanted a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. And why do I say that? Because we're the only creation that has been made in God's image. Again, I know you've heard this many times before in the church, but can, why, are we in, why are we the only beings created in his image? That we have God's imprint all over us. And then it says that he gave us his spirit, which literally means breath. Why? Because I believe God wanted to have a relationship with us. That we are the only beings who could actually know God because we have his spirit, that we are made in his image. And so to really understand that God, as crazy as it is, because no other religion has this. It sounds crazy. It almost sounds cult-like. But it says that Jesus is coming as a bridegroom to take his bride home, that we are going to marry God. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about this to our junior high students. I even talked about sex being holy because that's what it is. It's set apart, holy means. And it is something you don't share with any other besides your spouse. Okay? Maybe they weren't quite ready for that sex talk. Okay? The junior high boys started calling me sus uh, after the message. But I think it's important that they actually hear that uh, in church uh, rather than things from the world. But anyway, coming back to this, that he really desired an eternal companion. That's why Jesus says, when I go away, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit who will be with you forever. It's kind of wild to think of God in such terms. A brand new creation, a race that was created in his image with his very spirit. And to understand the heart of our bridegroom king who declares that he desires us, that he loves us, right? I mean, who would come? <laughs> I mean, why would he marry us if he didn't love us? I say this like when I was engaged to my wife, if she really just didn't look forward to our wedding day and wanted to keep postponing and postponing and postponing it, at some point, I would probably be like, you know, let's forget this, right? And I pray that we would not be such people because sometimes in the church, when we talk about the return of Jesus, it sometimes feels like you're talking to a bunch of people who would rather postpone that, postpone that, postpone that, postpone that because it doesn't do anything in their hearts, I deliberately asked the worship team today to play songs that declared who God is. Because sometimes we can make our faith so much like the spirit of the world, lovers of self. It's so man-centric, okay? To use a fancy term, anthropomorphic, instead of theocentric, instead of God-centered. Even our faith sometimes reflects that. So bad things happen to us, and then we just rage at God, okay? Bad things happening in the world, and we're tired of it. But instead, like to where God is really at the center of our faith, like he really, the world really revolves around him. It's about his will. It's about his glory, not about ours. And so it's not that we, we shouldn't worship God for what he has done on our behalf. It would honestly be kind of hard to worship him without that aspect. But like, you know, sometimes I see people get really excited to worship God when it's talking about like what God's mercy has done for us or his grace over us. But when we talk about the glory of God filling the whole earth like water over the seas, sometimes you see blank faces at church and that should not be where the people of God have no passion for the glory of God. When we ascribe to him 
His righteousness in the Psalms, it glories and rejoices in the God of righteousness. I wonder how many times in the church we are so excited and, and, and so thrilled that our God is a righteous judge, that we rejoice in his holiness. And I was telling the junior high kids, because my message was on holiness, that it was actually our privilege to live a life that is holy. Because number one, we can't even make ourselves holy. God does that for us. And I'm glad that we are called to live holy lives, that we're not called to live a lives of harlots. We're not called to dishonor. We are not called to filth. But God has enabled us and privileged us to be able to live lives of holiness. And again, holiness not meaning following just rules, that God is not just interested in just, okay, do A, B, C, D, and E. Oh, you did it. Oh, that's great. But being set apart meant that it was all of your affection, devotion, that he was our first love, and there was nothing that would compete against that. To be set apart, like our wife, our husband is set apart, like even sexual relationship is set apart, that it was an intimacy that would be shared with no other. And it was our privilege, our joy, holiness, meaning that we will be so in love with God that there will be no room for anything else to infiltrate that place. So again, if you remember the story in the Garden of Eden, that they were without shame when they were naked. But it wasn't that they weren't just unashamed when they were naked in front of each other, but they were also unashamed of their nakedness before God until sin came and they wanted to hide. That level of intimacy, being fully known, that was always a design. And I share with you guys about the wedding I went to yesterday, a wedding I'm gonna, I really look forward to going uh, this Saturday because marriage unlike what people of the world think, is not like a human idea or institution. It was always God's design. Scripture started in marriage in Genesis 2, where Adam and Eve, the bridegroom and the bride, are in the garden together, naked, unashamed. And God's first command to creation was to be fruitful and multiply. Because again, as, as crazy as it may sound, I believe God wanted a family, eternal brides of his. And Jesus talks about himself as a bridegroom. In the scriptures, in Isaiah, in Hosea, in Jeremiah, there's passages about the bridegroom and the bride, and it's a prophecy regarding Jesus. And not only that, in the Apostle Paul's letter, he says, I have breathed betrothed you to Christ, and I long for you with a jealous love, he says. And all of Scripture ends with a wedding, a wedding supper of the Lamb. And blessed are they who are invited to this, the Scripture declares. So wedding, marriage, is God's idea, God's institution, it shouldn't come to you as a coincidence or a surprise that these kinds of institutions are attacked in our society. Remember in the book of Revelation in the end times that there is a great harlot, right? The whore of Babylon. Do you think that the rampant sexual immorality is just coincidence or is Satan after the bride of Christ? To destroy her. Because we understand that the biggest sin you can commit, the biggest betrayal you can commit as a bride or a bridegroom is sexual immorality, right? It's cheating on someone. You're betraying that trust. And so it is by no coincidence that in the end times, the spirit of the whore of Babylon, the great harlot, will come to try to steal, kill, and destroy God's people with sexual immorality, the way homosexuality is promoted, 
where if you're against that lifestyle, you are immediately called a bigot, redefining marriage, redefining gender, internet pornography, all of these things, it is exactly the spirit of the whore of Babylon. Why? Because in the end times, we are called to be a bride of Christ. And that is the first way that the enemy will attack us to make us lose sense of our identity and who we are. I fear for the next generation. I remember when I was a high school student is when internet pornography became a thing. And it affected our entire generation, I believe. So much for the worse. Where I remember with this men's accountability group I had, I asked, what would our marriage, what would our wedding day look like, wedding night look like, if none of us had ever watched a single shred of pornography? And it was just an imagination that we, none of us could really grasp, but wish that we had. Now with virtual reality and like where people can even uh, feel things now, the things that they make, I, I, I have no doubt that the enemy will use all of those devices to increase the wickedness of the age. So having said all of that, the beginning of creation, bridegroom and bride, the end of creation, Jesus coming for his Bride. Remember when Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, before he was to hang on the cross, he prayed to the Father, I wish they were with me where I am. You see the heart that he had, that he longed for us to be with him eternally. But he knew at that moment we couldn't. When Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to go away but I will come back to prepare a place for you. I don't believe Jesus is saying nice, encouraging words. I believe he meant exactly what he said, and I believe he is doing exactly what he declared, that he really is preparing a place for us, and he definitely is coming back so that he could take his bride home. So while one of the challenges for us in our society is to actually understand how small we are before God and not be arrogant like the spirit of the age, but actually humble ourselves before God like I shared last month. The other aspect is we don't fully understand just how much he loves us. In fact, it says, right, in Ephesians 3, that only through the power of the Holy Spirit we would understand just how wide and long, how high and deep his love is for us. So we need God to able to love God and know God. But one of the things that is very important for us to grasp is, oh, if I need God to know him, then like, well, God knows where I am and he needs to come find me. But how God usually operates, and we see it in Jesus' ministry, he moved and he revealed himself according to the spiritual hunger and appetite that we had. When we came to him broken and desperate, we longed for him. You know, I was sharing with our high school pastor yesterday at the wedding because I was sitting next to him about uh, some of our new freshmen, girls, uh, not like to call them out or anything. They're not here, even though they should be, because we don't have college service. But uh, all kidding aside, I'm, I, have no, there's, I have nothing against it, but my, my simple thing that I said to our high school pastor was, I fear for their souls. Because... I felt like a good majority of them, if they went off to college, I don't think they would sniff the door of a church. I see their worship attitude in college service. Many of them don't even come consistently. We have a college retreat going on right now, and, I, and there were a number of our freshman girls signed up, and I found out that they collectively agreed not to show up on the day of. And again, I'm not upset or angry. I just fear for their souls. I really do. Because this is not some like, oh, are you going to a church retreat? Or It's not about that because I really believe eternity lies in the balance. And when I see them, there's nothing that I see that makes me think, wow, they know the Lord. 
and I fear for their eternity, eternal destination. I really do. And I'm going to share that with them. And I don't know how they'll take it, but I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I really, I really do say, I, I, I'm going to share that with them because I'm genuinely concerned and I feel like that's the most loving thing I can do. And just like these girls who chose not to go, like I say, if it's raining outside and if you want to get wet, you have to get out of the house. And likewise, if we want to know his love, you don't just sit there and be like, well, I need his help, so like, I mean, he can come find me. But like, we would choose to go to places, whether it's like a college retreat, whether it's this upcoming TD or whatever, we would choose to go outside so you can get wet where there are places where there, it's built on prayer and that God's Spirit is moving and we would intentionally move ourselves and position our hearts in a place where we could receive what the Lord desires. To a certain degree, you know, God has used uh, Threats DSTD powerfully at our church, especially in the KM. And there was a time when we used to do it where a lot of high school graduates would come so these guys who just graduated out of high school and they're, they haven't even entered college and it wasn't so good with them. No offense, I know some of you guys went you know, right out of high school and the reason why we put a minimum age of 20 is because I believe it was powerful for a lot of these KM folks because they had experienced life and the difficulties, and even the bitterness of it, especially a lot of them as immigrants coming to a country they did not know, they did not speak the language, and they felt foolish in. And in their brokenness, when they were loved lavishly, like TD is meant to, it just overwhelmed them. When you did it with spoiled high school kids, you know, who are driving their, you know, beamers that they didn't buy, and then you lavish them with love, it's just like one more thing. You know, there, there's no appreciation of that, which is exactly why we don't let them go. And I recommend against them going because I feel like you need to understand. And so to a certain degree, I feel like that's what I'm trying to do from last, last time, last month to now, is understanding the brokenness aspect, just really just how worthless we are really before a holy God and understanding that place, but then when we are called the bride of Christ, just being so mind blown by the God who loves us in that regard. An eternal companion that God didn't create us just so he had fun telling us to follow a couple of rules. He called us to himself, and revealed his moral character through his law. And we get to live a life that reflects his righteousness, his love, that we don't want to walk in disobedience. We don't want to walk in uh, impurity and filth. It's our joy and honor to live a life that is holy and pleasing to him, set apart in love. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I want to go through quickly a couple of passages from the book of Matthew. So in Matthew 21, Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time, knowing exactly what his mission is, that he's going to go hang on the cross. Okay, so that's Matthew 21. And starting with Matthew 22, he gives his last teachings. And this is what the kingdom of God is like, he said. So Matthew 22, verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he said to his servants, verse 8, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Remember, they give all kinds of excuses. One of them says, You know what? I, uh, I, bought, a I, I bought a field. I need to go check it out. I bought an ox, okay, oxen, I need to test them out. Uh, I just got married. And again, these are like the best excuses you could come up with. Because buying a field, that was their livelihood. It wasn't just like they bought some real estate and they just wanted to look at it. 
Okay, this is how they lived off the land. They survived off it. When they bought oxen, that wasn't just like some pets. Like this is how they survived. And then the last one, he said, well, I just got married. And the king, it says, is furious. It's not good enough. The best reasons that you could have come up with in an agrarian society 2,000 years ago. So he says to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners, invite to the bank of anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now in the scriptures, Jesus says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And I've seen that, even in the life of the church. You know why we should evangelize? I mean, it's not only to give God glory and to save souls, but like when church evangelizes and new believers come, it brings like a breath of fresh air into the church where you look at these new believers who may not have a lot of knowledge, but like they're so eager and so sincere in the Lord, so grateful, and like it reminds you like, oh, I need to be like that again too. Or sometimes the first shall be last, like, you know, you have leaders in the church and they, you know, they, they do well, they know what they're doing, but then sometimes they get a little bit crusty, but then you get new leaders who breathe new life into the church, like, yeah, first shall be last, last shall be first. And here it's the same thing. When, when we hear that and when we see this wedding banquet, look, all these people are invited, but Jesus says they weren't worthy. They didn't want to come. If we are not ready or desirous of Jesus coming back, our bridegroom king, to take his bride home for all of eternity, then you have to ask yourself, Am I worthy? Am I one of those who are invited but choose not to come? Even a wedding, getting married was not a good enough excuse because our wedding here on earth, our marriage here on earth, was actually supposed to be a small glimpse of our eternal marriage to Jesus. Sometimes I officiate weddings, do premarital counseling. Sometimes with, because I had relationship with their parents, they asked me to wed their kids, and they're not walking in the Lord. And I don't know where to start with them because this is God's design. But then even people in the church, I feel like we get wrapped up into a very humanistic, okay, human-centered view. So we think marriage exists to make us happy. Marriage exists, you know, to find that lifelong partner that fulfills us. And when you go into marriage expecting it to make you happy, then we demand happiness from our spouse. But the only one who can truly make us happy and fulfill us is God himself so instead of being filled with the love of Jesus and giving that to our spouse, and we demand love from, or happiness from our spouse, and when they don't meet it, we get upset. But even a lot of people in the church, they get wrapped up into the Cinderella. I mean, just, just this worldly understanding that our marriage was not just simply supposed to be like so that you could be happy and you could have a nice house and have beautiful kids, but like that our marriage, actually, Jesus makes it very clear, right? Ephesians 5, the famous go-to passage, verses 22 to 33, that to wives, uh, submit to your husbands, okay? Talk about an unpopular teaching today. Okay, something that feels like it should be taught like 100 years ago. No, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that the marriage relationship was actually supposed to be a reflection of Christ's relationship to his people, his bride, his church. And that our marriage is not, does not exist so that we can just be happy with our two and a half kids and a dog and a picket fence, but like it's to display the glory and the beauty of Jesus and his love for his church, his bride. And we need to recover that vision in the church. But if that's the purpose of marriage, it's hard for me to know where to start with people who do not know the Lord.
Let's go to the next slide, please. And I know you've, heard, you've seen this passage many times, but I really believe it's important for us to really receive this. So Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time. He teaches about what his kingdom is like, like a wedding banquet. And then he moves on to talk about what to expect in the end times. Okay, this is what's going to happen. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. All these are beginnings of birth pains. I mean, we see that right now in Ukraine, I don't know, you know, a lot of us, we have short memories and it doesn't affect us. We don't care. And, and, and unfortunately, I hope that's not the case, but a lot of people, that's like, they're like that, right? So we're, we have a war of the greatest significance in Europe since World War II. And it's only the beginning. Jesus promised that in the end, there will be great pestilences. And COVID-19 hit. First global pandemic in 100 years. But what's important for the bride of Christ to understand is not to complain our way through it like the people of the world does. So when is it going to be over? I'm sorry, but it's going to keep happening. You think Ukraine's going to be it? You think Putin will stop? Is Taiwan going to get invaded? Probably. These things are going to happen, he said. And what's important for the church is not complaining our way through and wondering when it's going to be over when Jesus told us these are things that are going to continue to happen and in abundance, but asking the Lord, what is it that you're trying to teach me? What is it that you're trying to teach your bride, the church, in this season, in this hour? And let's keep going. Let's go to the next slide. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. So Jesus is laying it out. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be hated. You're going to be killed. Not just hated, you know. I mean, I, I don't like being hated even by a single person, but by all nations. This is what's going to happen, he's saying. Okay? And at that time, many will turn away from the faith, and betray and hate each other. And I believe that we're also seeing the beginnings of this because I believe that in the end times, some of the greatest enemy of the church will be people who used to go to church, who grew up in the church, and at some point turned away in their faith, got offended, and you may see that on social media. But why is Jesus telling us these things, okay? Now, some theological camps say, like, at that time, many will turn away from the faith, and they're like, oh, they were ne never saved in the first place, you know, it, it just reveals that they weren't. Um, and then there's other camp that says, actually, they were in the faith, but then they chose to go against it. It's called apostasy, turning away from the faith, okay, renouncing Jesus. I personally believe in the second part, but regardless of your theological inclinations, what is sure is Jesus said at that time, many will turn away from the faith. And remember, in the scriptures, we need to receive the encouragements and the warnings both. And instead of thinking that in our arrogance that we're always on the sweet side of the bell curve because we happen to come to church, remember it says many will turn away from the faith. Okay, let's keep going. So what is universally agreed on by all theologians is that there will be a great falling away in the end times. And part of that reason is verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I think it's really unfortunate because we have 
weird things going on in the body of Christ in the United States these days, okay? It's like this mixed political message. It's not really gospel, but you got these pastors telling their congregants to buy up guns and ammo and get ready for civil war so that we could kill people and not be killed. When Jesus told us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and spirits, principalities of this world. And in verse 14, it tells us simply that the gospel of the kingdom, right, will be preached to all nations and then the end will come. I'm not saying you can't own a gun. I'm not saying you can't defend yourself. But as believers, I believe that what we should get busy in is preaching the gospel to the kingdoms rather than stocking up on guns and preparing for some you know, civil war that may or may not come. Why is it that this is a condition before Jesus is coming? And I say it like this, why is the increase, why is there increase in the wickedness where love of most will grow cold? If I were to use like a military analogy, if someone was being trained to be a Green Beret or, you know, the Navy SEALs, I mean, they, they, they go through crazy training, okay? I've only heard of it. I've read about it. It's like, I'm like, wow, they're, they're trying to kill these people, right? I mean, they take you to the brink of death almost because that, I guess that's the kind of training that they need, the special forces. And in a sense, when we see Revelation 19, it's not just a few people who get saved. There is a great multitude who choose to love the Lamb, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, who was slain and resurrected on their behalf. And they were faithful even to the point of death. And it's just nations upon nations of people declaring how worthy He is. And why is that happening? In conjunction, where the wedding banquet is coming in conjunction with the day of judgment. I mean, is God schizophrenic? Like, he loves, but then he, you know, he, he pours out wrath. One of the things, because we're human and we're finite, we have to understand, like, when we hear we're the bride of Christ, when we hear we're the slave, bond slaves of God, when we hear we're his sons and daughters and so forth, like, we kind of have to jump from one to one to one and try to hold it in tension and so forth. But God is not like that, okay? God is infinitely loving. He is infinitely just. But he doesn't have to jump from one attribute to another. He's like that in all of his qualities, eternally and simultaneously. And what is going on is that in that kind of environment where there is a great increase in wickedness and many love will grow cold, it is actually that environment where the bride of Christ arises and show themselves to be lovers of Jesus. That Jesus is not returning when things are just kind of like, you know, decent or, or like just half-hearted and, and like, oh yeah, there's these people who love him, but like it's going to be like a crucible almost of like those who stand firm to the end will be saved, but then there's going to be an environment, a world that hates us, a world that believes in something else and great increase in wickedness. As we see the spirit of the harlot, the whore of Babylon, in, uh, just increasing, attacking Human sexuality, family, all of these things, but it is in those times where the bride of Christ will reveal herself to be who she truly is. It's not like God loves it, you know, to make us suffer or make us go through hardship because he thinks that's decent and nice for us. It is that very environment where there will be a glorious bride arising and will show herself to be different from the world who is now following the spirit of the Antichrist, and he is coming too, for sure. You may very well know the passage from Corinthians where Apostle Paul says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
a lot of times youth pastors, college pastors will tell their students, don't date unbelievers. Um, I think that should be obvious because it says, what does light have to do with darkness? If Jesus really means anything to you, I honestly can't see (laughs) why we would choose to yoke ourselves or date someone who does not know the Lord. It just doesn't make any sense. But coming back to my point, when Jesus returns to receive his bride, he also will not be unequally yoked. That he says, those whom he justified, that he will glorify. And he is not coming for a whatever bride. He is coming for a pure and spotless bride whom he has washed by his word, by his blood. And that is who he is calling us to be. That is, that is what human is. And that was always God's design. Let's go to the next slide. You know, it is not by coincidence. Sorry, I, I drink a lot of water when I preach. It is not by coincidence that Jesus' first miracle happened at a wedding in Cana, where he turned water into wine. And out of all Jesus' miracles, on just a humanistic, natural level, I would say that's probably one of his least uh, impressive miracles. But the purpose of that was, back then, the Jews, they would ceremonially, ceremonially wash themselves with water before they could enter the temple. But him turning that water into wine, he was declaring that a new day had arrived, where no longer will people be ceremonially cleaned by the washing of water, but that now they will be washed by the blood. And it won't be that they will be ceremonial clean, but that they would actually be clean. That's what that miracle is. But like, again, it's not coincidence that he did his first miracle at a wedding. It's a thread from beginning of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, and he was revealing himself to be the ultimate, the eternal, glorious bridegroom. And so when he shares what's going to happen in the end times, the very next teaching he shifts to is a parable of the ten virgins, how an end time people need to live. And notice that these are ten virgins. Virgin, virginity indicated something pure, right? This is what Jesus did for us. And now it goes on. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, told, took oils and jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Next slide. Verse 6. At midnight, they, the cry rang out, Here's a bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others who came, Lord, 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 they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. That verse 13 is for you and for me. It is not something spoken to other people. We all must keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So after the end time, what's going to happen in Matthew 24 now? He's telling us this is how we ought to live. There are some variety of interpretations of what that oil means, but generally speaking, theologians agree that it speaks of love, fidelity, steadfastness. So here, five of the virgins had the oil, five did not. Now, if you think about it, again, 
The greatest commandments that God has given us is to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and, and love our neighbors as ourselves. The greatest commandment is not, God's not telling us, go do this, go do this, go do that. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. It's all summarized, he's saying, love me and love others with that love. Again, he was not trying to just make humans to give us rules. He wanted eternal companions who will walk in partnership with him. And so that's why we're familiar with the churches in the book of Revelation, the seven churches. It starts with the church of Ephesus and ends with the church of Laodicea. And the first church gets rebuked. Why? Jesus tells him, you don't love me like you used to. You lost your first love. Repent and to do, do the things that you did at first or I will remove your lampstand away. And that lampstand was obviously had light and back then you needed oil to keep it burning. Okay, there was no electricity or anything like that and removing the lampstand meant the life was going out. And likewise, there were virgins who had the oil and there were those who did not. But they were all invited to the banquet. And then, of course, we, the famous church, probably the most famous church out of the seven, the Church of Laodicea, where it was a very wealthy place in that time, okay? Kind of like us. And Jesus tells him, you think you're rich, but you're poor. You're naked, okay? You don't even see. You don't have spiritual eyes to see how wretched you are, he says. And because you are lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, so repent. Then God gives them maybe the greatest promise out of those seven churches. Then I will come to dine with you and you with me, and I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. Incredible. But maybe more than the throne is that we get to sit with him together. And so what I'm saying is this. It's unfortunate because when you talk to lukewarm people, I mean, because they don't have spiritual eyes to hear or see, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that always needs to be the first priority of our lives. And I, I must be honest myself, like sometimes I lose my way, and so I constantly need readjustment back. Like, okay, I need to bring this back. I need to bring this back. You know, like Martha, she, you know, we need to be like Mary. Like Martha, she was serving, right? And then she, she got upset. It's not like Mary just sat and did nothing all her life. But the reason why a lot of people in the church, they burn out, is because they serve with the wrong spirit or out of their own strength. It's usually not because they're like serving too much, but... We need to be like Mary, that even when Mary's in the kitchen, she knows who she is doing it for and with what spirit she is doing. But anyway, coming back, if you are lukewarm, that's actually an emergency. That's an emergency. So when Jesus tells them to repent, he's not telling them to repent tomorrow or next week. It's our arrogance to think, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that next week or next year when I'm 25, when I'm 35, as if you can control the heartbeat that you have or the, you know, you just never know. God really is the author of life. That's the only thing that matters when we die is our love for the Lord. We're not taking our cars or houses. That's the only thing. But what's amazing, let's go to the next slide, is that in Revelation 19, when we, are, when we see, I believe, the greatest moment, the climax of all of human history, when the bride of Christ will be revealed. 
And it says, I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has, lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Amen. Notice, the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And what Jesus promises us is that even giving a cup of cold water, that will not be forgotten. And that what you do in, in the Lord's name, he will reward you. And that's the way of God's kingdom. Even small acts get richly rewarded in the eternal kingdom. Let me ask the worship team to come, and I want to kind of tie the knots together and bring things to a close. If you're young enough, say you're in your, you're in your 20s or early 30s, you've probably gone through church, and they probably emphasize a lot on your identity as he should. I think it's really important. But even that, I sometimes feel like gets tinged with this humanistic, okay, man-centered faith, which is really no Christian faith at all. And I just focus so much on identity, 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 and then we try to relate to God. But actually, the right order is beholding who God is. And understanding the truth of who he is, and then finally understanding the truth of who we are in him. So one of the things that God spoke to me very clearly, I believe, in prayer this past week was, and he was speaking that over, um, I believe, a lot of us, including myself, that he was going to, it was a showing a, a vision of taking off your old glasses and putting on a new pair of glasses to get a clearer vision of who he was, our bridegroom king. Not only is he God Almighty, but he is Jesus, who longed for his disciples to be with him where he was, who, has prepared a, who is preparing a place for us, and who promised that he will come to take us as his bride, lavished by his love. Part of the reason I believe that there are people in the church who are born, I mean, the main reason is because you're, you're not being able to see him. If you are able to see him with your spiritual eyes, you would never be born. You would be captivated by the glory of who he is, you will be fascinated by his wonders, and you will be just so overwhelmed by his love. Which is why that is also part of the scripture's prayer in Ephesians 1, Paul's prayer for the church, that you will have the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know this. But when we understand that he is the glorious bridegroom who jealously loves us and is longing to come to take us home. That when you understand this incredible love where you are treasured by him, that he is so, so in love with us. And he desires people like you and me and longs to bring us into that glorious, eternal relationship with Him, then I think everything changes when we behold Him as our bridegroom who loves us so much that all He wanted, as spoken in the great commandments, was to love Him back, that to the churches he wrote, love me. That's all he desired. Can I ask everyone to rise at this time?
going to lead us in prayer, uh, and then we will close with song together. Um, let's take this time uh, to worship Him and declare who He is. Uh, so we'll actually do the song uh, this time first, and then I'll lead us in a couple of prayers together. Uh, yeah, so let's lift up our hearts. Let's lift up, lift up our voices before the Lord together, shall we?